Hey friends, welcome back to the journal feed. My name is Nick Zelt, and this is the only place to get spoon-fed the latest and greatest of emergency medicine. Here we're trying to make keeping up with the literature as easy as possible for you by spoon-feeding you the latest research. Now let's take a quick look ahead at everything that we're about to be covering. First off, there's more to critical care than care of just the critical. Next, the best time to tube them in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. From the third article, we'd all like an easy way to find the cricothyroid membrane, and here we actually have one for you. Then, ultrasounds are great for line placement, but might they be increasing the risk of infection? And then from the fifth article, critically ill patients are at critical risk for delirium. Our pain control strategies might be worsening that. This is the audio version of the past week summaries, which this week were brought to you by the Red Hot, Rachel Jennings, Aaron Lacey, Jonathan Brewer, and Clay Smith. So, I bring you the first article which was titled ICU Survivorship, the Relationship of Delirium, Sedation, Dementia, and Acquired Weakness, out of the Journal of Critical Care Medicine. Perhaps now more than ever, I mean, given the stress that COVID's put on our medical system, emergency medicine doctors are being asked to do more critical care medicine than before. And emergency department boarding of these patients is almost becoming the norm. We know that boarding of these patients is not good for their outcomes, so we need to be as on top of our game as possible to improve those outcomes. In critical care, you need to do much more than just treat the disease. You also have to actively battle against the iatrogenic harms that we do to these patients in trying to keep them alive. The term put to these factors affecting long-term outcomes for ICU patients is post-intensive care syndrome. This is actually quite well studied. It's a form of cognitive impairment, physical impairment, and or mental health impairment seen in patients who survive the ICU. So let's dig into three important concepts that help us deliver better care in this regard. First off is delirium. Now you might roll your eyes, think about gen debt, but don't underestimate delirium. It's an independent predictor of mortality and morbidity in the ICU. So think about integrating tools like CAM-ICU for timely diagnosis and treatment of this terrible condition. Delirium is a risk factor for dementia that can persist even after discharge. The next point is about sedation and paralysis. Now, I know that recent paper that we talked about for paralysis awareness has probably frightened some of you, but you still need to go pretty easy on these patients. Use guideline-driven light sedation strategies whenever possible, and use lung protective ventilation, I mean always. If these patients are boarding with you, then consider a spontaneous awakening and breathing trial to lighten the sedation, and maybe get these patients off the vent sooner than they otherwise would have been. Lastly is the problem of immobility. The earlier that physiotherapy and occupational therapy can be seeing these patients is really the better. They need early mobilization to reduce muscle wasting and weakness. Check out the A, B, C, D, E, F bundle for some helpful tips in this regard. Now, I know, I know, I know. Nursing support limitations make a lot of these things really difficult to do. But we can't take the first steps unless we're at least thinking about them. In a spoonful, first, do no harm is what they say. Though I don't believe that entirely, and we've even covered an article on that. But in critical care, you know, they're trying to catch up with just that prospect, let alone surpassing it. It's important we do all we can to mitigate post-intensive care syndrome. That includes delirium prevention, sedation stewardship, and early mobility. Then we have the second article, which was titled The Association of Advanced Airway Insertion Timing and Outcomes for Out-of-Hospital Cardiac Arrest Out of the Annals of Emergency Medicine. All right, we talked about this last week, actually. The best airway to be placed in the setting of -of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. We saw that there wasn't actually a big difference or benefit between securing the airway and just bagging them. That being said, uh, securing the airway is often a priority, even though we know that what matters most is really high-quality chest compressions and getting a shockable rhythm if you can. It's not that it's not not important to secure an advanced airway, but where should this actually be falling on our priority list? What's the best timing for getting an advanced airway, either with an ET tube or a supraglottic airway? This study was actually a secondary analysis of the Pragmatic Airway Resuscitation Trial, abbreviated to PART. 
They analyzed a laryngeal mask group and an endotracheal tube group, each with about 100 patients. And then they measured the time after starting advanced life support. They were then able to propensity match these groups and look for outcomes. The timing groups were broken up into five minute chunks, which I think is a little bit too big actually, but that's what they did. Zero to five minutes, five to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 20, and over 20 minutes. Their findings was that there was no association with survival to hospital discharge found for either airway type, that is ET tube or superglottic, for any time point. So it seems like it doesn't really matter when you do it, or like we saw last week, it might not even matter if you do it. So the original part trial was to compare superglottic airways and endotracheal intubation, which favored superglottic airways for several outcomes, including survival. In the end, the data from multiple sites seems to say that as long as you're ventilating, it doesn't really seem to matter how. A superglottic airway does seem like the simplest solution, though, and it's less work than bag valve mask. So as long as you're keeping the priority on chest compressions and assessment for a shockable rhythm, don't worry too much about ventilation as long as you're doing it. In a spoonful, there appear to be no benefits or harms to survival for the timing of when you secure an advanced airway in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And then we have the third article, which was titled Comparison of the Conventional Downward and Modified Upward Laryngeal Handshake Techniques to Identify the Cricothyroid Membrane, a Randomized Comparative Study out of the Journal of Anesthesia and Analgesia. In a can't oxygenate, can't ventilate situation, let's be honest, you're going to be pretty nervous about it, but a surgical airway is going to be needed. The last thing you want to be worrying about is finding your landmarks. That way you can focus on actually doing the procedure and not spend too much time poking around in the neck. But let's keep in mind that this is a blind procedure, so the poking around part is pretty much the most important part. The ideal solution is one that can be done by muscle memory, is reproducible in all but the worst anatomical necks, and doesn't rely on the prominent thyroid cartilage that only half of the population, the male half, actually has. These authors sought to evaluate two techniques of cricothyroid membrane identification, randomizing patients undergoing elective general anesthesia as their models. They used only female patients because these are typically the trickier patients, and they had about a total of 200 patients. The first method was the traditional laryngeal handshake method. Start by grasping the hyoid bone, then move caudally to the thyroid laminae, and from there just below that is the cricothyroid membrane. The second method was the modified laryngeal handshake, done by grasping the trachea at the sternal notch, then move cranially to find the cricoid cartilage, and just above that is the cricothyroid membrane. Confirmation of finding the membrane was done with ultrasound. The group more likely to identify the cricothyroid membrane was with the modified approach. That's the down and work up approach. They were finding the membrane correctly 84% of the time compared to just 56% of the time in the conventional approach group. That's an odds ratio of 4.36. Midline was also more likely to be correctly identified in this modified approach group, and neither technique took more time than the other. So as you can see from what they used as a gold standard, ultrasound is a great way to find the membrane, but it's just not practical if you're really in a pinch. If you're anticipating a difficult airway, then by all means, use ultrasound and mark your landmarks. But if you don't have time for that, then this modified laryngeal handshake is going to be my new approach. In a spoonful, here's a new way to find the cricothyroid membrane, working from the trachea up. It actually worked better than the conventional method in an all-female population. And then we have the fourth article, titled Ultrasound Guidance and Risk of Central Venous Catheter-Related Infections in the Intensive Care Unit, a post-ad hoc analysis of individual data of three multi-center randomized trials, out of the Journal of Clinical Infectious Diseases. Ultrasound has done wonders for line placement. It lets us see where we're going, so it's safer and more often successful but it also adds something into our sterile field. Just one more thing that's there. Does this play a role in infection? This article was a post ad hoc analysis of three prior RCTs to determine the rate of catheter-related bloodstream infections and as a secondary outcome, major catheter-related infections. 
The RCTs were designed to test the effect of preventative agents like chlorhexidine dressing or skin antiseptics on infection rates. So ultrasound use wasn't actually randomized in any of these trials. There was a total of 4,600 patients and 5,500 lines inserted at various locations in the body at 19 ICUs. What they found was an association after waiting of ultrasound and catheter-related bloodstream infections in both the jugular and femoral sites. There was a hazard ratio of 2.21. This association was actually not present for subclavian lines. There was also an association with major catheter-related infections and catheter colonization after removal with ultrasound as well. I would interpret this study not as a reason not to use ultrasound, but just to be very careful when you do, and to take infection prevention very seriously. Now, of course, this data, while collected very well, don't get me wrong, it still wasn't collected with this purpose in mind, so you should take it with a grain of salt. In a spoonful, there is an association between the use of ultrasound for intravenous catheter placement and an increased risk for catheter-related bloodstream infections. And which finally brings us to the last article, titled Opioid Use Increases the Risk of Delirium in Critically Ill Adults Independent of Pain, out of the American Journal of Respirology and Critical Care Medicine. The body's go-to warning sign that something's wrong is probably pain. It's a clear message that you need to seek out help. Guess what? We are that help. And alleviating pain is something that we take quite seriously. Unfortunately, pain is not the only harmful thing out there, and so we need to try not to cause more harm when treating pain. Multiple cohort studies have investigated a link between opioid use in the ICU and the occurrence of delirium. So far, a causal link hasn't really been established, but this trial seeks to put that to rest. This was a prospective observational study of 4,000 adults admitted to the ICU for more than 24 hours. Mental status exams, such as CAM-ICU, were done on each patient to classify patients into three categories every day. They were either awake with delirium, had delirium, or they were unarousable. Validated pain scales were also done to assess for pain. All patients' medications were recorded, any opioids they used were converted into morphine-equivalent doses. A first-order Markov model was utilized with multinomial logistic regression analysis to analyze 11 delirium-related covariables and possible next-day outcomes to look at the effect of opioids and their dose on delirium occurrence the next day. They recorded over 26,000 days in the ICU. Opioids were given on 57% of those days. That's a lot of opioids. And 23.5% of those days were delirium days. Any opioid use in awake patients without delirium actually increased the risk of delirium the following day, an odds ratio of 1.45. On top of that, there was a dose-dependent response so for each 10 milligram increment, there was a 2.4% greater chance of delirium the next day. Now, they did a lot to try to control for everything, but this could still be muddied by patients having more pain, thus requiring more opioids. And even if the pain wasn't associated and was controlled for, there could still be more going on. It's hard to say. But we're not likely to get randomized data on something like this unless we have a really good alternative for pain control for these patients. Anyways, in a spoonful, do opioids increase the risk of delirium in critically ill patients? Essentially, this trial says yes. I'd like to know if this was for all patients, are younger patients less at risk, but I'm not sure. It's something to look into, and there's no clear alternatives per se. All of this, though, is really great food for thought. And that wraps us up. That's everything I had to talk about. So let's go over everything that I just talked about. What did we learn today? From the first article, include these things as part of your post-intubation care package. Delirium prevention, sedation stewardship, and early mobilization. For patients requiring critical care, these are factors that play a large role in their long-term outcomes. From the second article, focus on chest compressions and shocks if appropriate. An advanced airway is nice to have, but doesn't seem to improve outcomes no matter when you put it in. From the third article, finally, glad to see a simple method for landmarking the cricothyroid membrane that's not going to be more difficult in females. 
This down-up approach starting at the trachea outperformed the conventional laryngeal handshake. From the fourth article, using ultrasound saves you a lot of energy worrying about trying to get a catheter line in safely. Instead, you can now direct that energy to worrying about infection prevention. This study showed an association between ultrasound use and catheter-related bloodstream infections. Finally, the last article, the fifth article, another strike against opioids. Their use in the ICU is associated with an increased chance of delirium, and uh, this acts in a dose-dependent manner. The more opioids, the higher the risk. And that really wraps us up. Don't forget, though, that we offer CME credits provided through a partnership with Hippo Education. All the details for that are at our website at journalfeed.org. If you'd like to support the podcast more particularly, please go ahead and leave a review, a nice comment. I'd love to read it. Links to all the articles summarized can also be found at our website. That's journalfeed.org again. And if you haven't already, you can subscribe to our newsletter and get daily spoon feeds through your email. Our goal here at The Journal Feed is to provide better patient care through spoon feeding. And so we're trying to help you keep up with the latest research one spoonful at a time. Thank you.